what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of inspiredinsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders, um, like the founders you've heard, some you've never heard of. Um, you've heard me say it before, um, Atari founder Noam Bushnell talked about how when Steve, he was Steve Jobs' mentor, Steve offered him 33% of Apple for $50,000. Why he said no. Baby Einstein founder Julie Clark fighting cancer and beating it. P90X founder Tony Horton talking about how he made money. You know, James, I like the, the tough stories, the challenge stories. We're in a really challenging time right now. And, you know, how he made money is a street mime. That's how he made food and rent money before selling hundreds of millions of dollars, probably almost a billion dollars at this point of P90X DVDs. Um, and so we're all, we've all been there. And right now in these crazy times, which we'll talk about with James Thompson, who's uniquely qualified to talk about the stuff going on on Amazon, um, before we get to that, um, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. And we help B2B businesses connect their Dream 100 clients, referral partners, and help you run your podcast so we're an easy button, but to make sure it generates ROI because that's what makes it sustainable, okay? Um, and so that's what we do for businesses. And it was inspired, and James, I don't know if you know this story, you may, I was inspired by pod, to start podcasting by my grandfather, who was a Holocaust survivor, and him and his brother were in concentration camps in Nazi Germany, were the only people to survive, and his legacy lives on because the Holocaust Foundation did an interview with him, and that interview is on my About page, and I watch it multiple times a year, and it's an inspiration to me, and so yes, podcasting is the best thing I've done for my business, but it's also helps me leave a legacy for my guests and myself as well. So it's a much, much deeper meaning to me. So if you have a business, period, down, you know, should have a podcast, you could email support at rise25media.com or, you know, or go to rise25.com and find out more. So today's guest, I am excited. He's been a guest before, um, James Thompson, seasoned entrepreneur, e-commerce expert. Um, you know, we were just chatting before we, we hit record is, in the past few weeks, 25 journalists or more have reached out to him. He was on CNBC talking about the stuff that's going on in Amazon. He was former business head of selling on Amazon. He developed the initial fulfillment by Amazon FBA nudge program that helped Amazon sellers generate an extra billion dollars in annual sales. In 2013, he founded Buybox Experts, which is a digital agency which provides the executive level advisory services and full service management. Basically, they help brands be unbeatable on Amazon. That's what they do. And he you know, uh, started it with Joe Hansen, his business partner, who's an amazing individual also. So that's what they do on Amazon. So if you are a brand, if you're not on Amazon, you're probably learning right now, you need to be on some kind, you need to be on Amazon because everyone's going shopping on Amazon right now. Um, so you can go to buyboxexperts.com and learn more. They have an amazing podcast. Um, where they feature their thought leadership and others in the e-commerce space. So, James, thanks for joining me. And um, I figured we'd, you know, they only gave you, I thought, a limited time on CS, you know, CNBC. Um, and you could have been the whole feature because of your knowledge. So that's what we're going to do. And so talk about, you know, we'll talk about changes on Amazon. Um, and... What are some of the things you're seeing right now that brands, well, first of all, they need to, you know, the conversation starts, they need to be on Amazon. In the first place, if they're not, what are some of the conversations that are coming to you, they're not on Amazon, and now they're like scrambling to get on Amazon? What, what's happening in those conversations right now? Jeremy, first, thank you for that amazing introduction. I, I, don't, I don't usually get an opportunity to... Uh... To, to, to be celebrated that way. So thank, thank you so much for the introduction. Much deserved. You're a humble guy. What is happening on Amazon right now? So uh, what, what is curious is that we're not hearing from a lot of brands right now who are saying, oh my gosh, the sky is falling. I don't have an Amazon channel strategy. What do I do? Give it another two weeks or so, that is going to start happening because the foot traffic across this country will disappear as everybody is told to stay home. And when that happens, 
the hard cold reality is for brands that have either shunned e-commerce or have shunned Amazon, they're going to realize that the only place that consumers are buying anything right now um, is online and typically on one of the big marketplaces. Amazon is the biggest one here in the U.S. Some stuff's happening on Walmart.com, but basically we're hearing about Amazon day in, day out, uh, just because of the massive scale, the massive selection of what they bring to, to, to consumers today. So uh, the, the, story, the story hasn't ended yet. Brands that aren't on Amazon are going to realize they need to have some sort of an online strategy. What is curious about this whole situation right now with the, the, health, the health situation we're in is many brands like to think that they will make the decision as to when they're ready to go e-commerce. And yet consumers have already said, we're going to buy stuff online. So if you're not online, um, you know, the brands are not part of the consideration anymore. I see a couple of things happening over the next two to three weeks as more and more people are finding themselves housebound. Consumers are going to be spending their money on figuring out how do I set up my home so I can work at home? How do I deal with being here with my kids seven days a week? <laughs> there are certain types of purchase decisions we're all going to need to make. A lot of uh, elective purchase decisions are going to be put off. I don't need a new pair of jeans. I don't need a new stereo. I don't need a big screen TV. Those things are not critical right now. Right now I need milk. I need a lot of toilet paper, but not the levels we're seeing being sold. <laughs> and I need coloring books for my kids. If we're still doing this come summertime, people are gonna transition the way they spend their money. We're gonna see people saying, you know what? I still have some disposable income. I need to buy stuff to make me happy. And I'm gonna buy that designer pair of jeans. I'm gonna buy a new barbecue or lawn patio furniture for my home because you know what? I can barbecue seven nights a week. So th these types of elective decisions that people are putting off uh, right now, you know, in the coming months, for those of us who are fortunate enough to still have regular income coming in, we're going to start buying stuff, as I say, to make us happy. Yeah. For, for the brands right now, for the types of products that aren't part of that essential, you know, to use Amazon's language, they're not essential products right now. Uh, that is to say, they're things we can put off for the time being for, for living at home full time. Th those types of companies, they're really hurting because they may already be on online, but consumers aren't spending parts of their wallet on these types of products. So unfortunately, those are the types of companies that have to ask themselves the hard questions around, do we have enough cash flow to keep going? Or are we going to be in a situation where four more weeks of 90% drops in sales, we can't make payroll, we can't pay our suppliers, we can't pay for our rent and all this kind of stuff. And there's unfortunately that, that cascading effect of, if I can't pay the next guy, the next guy can't pay the next guy and so on and so forth, even if I get a massive federal bailout and I get my SBA loan, at some point I'm going to have to cut. And if I cut too much, major limbs fall off the body. And when too many major limbs fall off the body, what am I doing as an entrepreneur? Um, so the companies that have cash flow today that have had enough discipline to be able to plan for a rainy day, and in this case, a very rainy day, these are the companies that are going to be in a position to have impressive opportunities that that come to them um, when you know when the war is over and we all have to figure out what the future looks like what the new normal looks like you know companies with cash are going to be in a position to take advantage of those opportunities yeah rainy day versus rainy month it's a much different scenario yep right yep um so you mentioned a few things um you mentioned opportunities but challenges also how are people maybe what are you hearing as far as people making really hard decisions right now? I mean, we don't know what's going to happen in the next few weeks or months or yep. six months. What, yep. what tough decisions are you seeing people make now to, so they can weather the storm? Uh, the most important question right now is how do you harvest cash and how do you prioritize who you pay first? Mm -hmm. We all have working capital and we all have bills that have to be paid. Some of those bills we're not going to pay right away. Well, some of those relationships with some of those vendors we work with are absolutely critical, and we know that we can't possibly lose those relationships. And so the conversations happening right now are talking with your vendors and saying, listen, I need to put off paying for a month. I need to put off paying for two months. What's your ability to bill me in two months versus one month? 
What's your ability to extend a line of credit to me so that I can keep working with you? Because we will come out of this. It's just, we need your inventory. We need your services right now, but I can't, I can't actively pay you for it. Um, the, the other question, and certainly, you know, in a company like ours, as a service organization, people pay us for our services. And so making sure that our clients are still paying us so that we in turn can make pay our bills, you know, th those are the kinds of conversations that typically a CFO in a company is keeping an eye on those sorts of things. But during times like this, everybody's got to be asking the question, are we taking on good business? And is the business that we already have the kind of business that is going to allow us to continue to be able to do what we do? Yeah. I mean, in the CNBC article, they talked about, you know, it's about how orders are surging, there's delays in deliveries, and it's threatening to put sellers out of business. Yep. Um, can you expand on that a little bit? You know, is it all, are we talking about, is this apply to everyone, just certain people? And how is it going to put sellers out of business? So Amazon as a platform is seeing unprecedented demand for its services. They basically have got themselves in a situation where they can't get orders out the door fast enough and delivered to consumers fast enough. And so think of it as there's a delivery pipe and there's too much being pushed through that delivery pipe. So they've announced they're going to hire 100,000 new people to help in the warehouses and deal with last mile delivery. Obviously, it takes time to hire 100,000 people and train them and get them ready to go. But <laughs> right. as, as you hire, you know, 1,000 people in this city, 1,000 people in that city, you start to expand the capacity of Amazon being able to do things in different cities. What we're seeing right now that depending on where you ship products, the delivery dates can be all over the map which tells me that Amazon has, a, has an issue right now where the local delivery capabilities vary widely. If you want to sell it or ship something in one city, they may have adequate delivery people. In another city, they may be way behind for, for the local demand. So as Amazon fills out some of those needs, they're going to be in a position where more stuff can go through the pipe, more consumers can get stuff faster, but also consumers can order more of all the stuff that's otherwise normally available from Amazon and, and expect to get it within the next three, four, five days versus what we're seeing with some non-essential products, you know, good luck getting it until the end of April or early May. Hmm. I mean, we're so, seeing some changes they're making, right, James, like not allowing replenishment of certain things. Yeah. So non-essential products are not being welcomed into Amazon's warehouses today whether those are third-party products being sold by third-party sellers or products that Amazon itself is buying from brands and putting into its own warehouses. They're, they're, they're not letting some of those types of products in because they want to focus on what they call essential products, which are products that are deemed to be absolutely critical at this very moment as people move into their homes seven days a week and get used to life at home, whether those are grocery products, whether those are certain types of home products, certain types of baby products, these are things that are higher priority than having another pair of Nike running shoes. Yeah. So if someone can't, let's say they're running out of stock and they can't replenish for the next yep. month yep. and they don't have enough for the rainy day, yep. then they may have to close the doors. Um, the choices become less and less obvious um, in terms of ways out of the, the, the system. Uh, I think that if we can look forward 60 days, 70 days, as people start to take disposable income and spend it on things that make them happy versus things they need to keep surviving. Many of these companies that are seeing very slow sales right now, they may start to see better sales in the future, but they're going to have this huge backlog of expenses and unpaid bills, whether they can make it through, whether they can weather through the next 60 to the 90 days, that, that, that is the question. Um, we are seeing some good news out of China, both in terms of warehouses, or excuse me, manufacturing is back up pretty much uh, where it needs to be. The ships are completely full coming to North America. Some of the Chinese manufacturers, uh, we, we've heard, some of them have been talking to companies that we deal with, uh, basically extending uh, more better payment terms so that companies in the U.S. who know that they're going to have a problem replenishing inventory because they don't have enough cash coming in to buy the inventory can at least get the opportunity to wait another 60 days or 90 days before making payment to some of these Chinese manufacturers. Again, everybody in the value chain is impacted. If the consumer doesn't have a job and doesn't have cash to spend on stuff, the seller doesn't have demand, 
the manufacturer doesn't have demand and all the way back all, all as far back to the, the raw material providers. So it's going to have that trickle effect over the next few months. Yes. Yes. And then even, even once we are told, Hey, it's safe. We can go back to society in, in the way that we thought it was. You're going to find a bunch of retail stores that are either unstaffed because they had to lay everybody off or people have adjusted to buying things online are not likely going to return as foot traffic to the stores. The last two or three years, look at how many traditional brick and mortar retailers have failed. That is only going to accelerate because consumer preferences have been fast forwarded here by five years just in the last couple months. Consumers have said, you know what? Actually, I can buy a lot of stuff. Yeah. It's available. It's dropped off at my house. It costs about the same amount as me going to the store. Unless I enjoy shopping versus just getting stuff I need to consume, the just getting stuff I need to consume part of my exercise. Totally. The online thing, you know, I can do the online thing just fine. You know, personal example, I had never used Amazon Fresh until last week. I used Amazon Fresh to get some groceries. Not only was everything I wanted in stock, most of it was cheaper than the local grocery store. And oh, by the way, the fact that it was in stock is a big difference from what I saw when I went to the grocery store a week and a half ago. So I don't know that I will forego buying. Well, James, and store. you save two hours of your life, right? Going to the store and back, and maybe you don't have to push the kids around and they're grabbing stuff off the shelf. I mean, in, in the reality-based uh, situation, yeah. that is huge, right? All this to say consumer preferences in terms of where they shop and how they shop, a lot of that's going to be evolving very, very quickly here. And I, I would not want to be in the business of trying to rebuild a retail store uh, post us re-engaging as a society. Yeah, I totally, yeah, it, what you're saying is we are drastically, what's happening is, you know, beha you know buying behavior is drastically changing right now. And it's accelerating like before, maybe, like you said, maybe it would take five or seven years for this to happen. Now it's taken weeks. Yep. And the same thing happened to me, James, is what's this Instacart thing? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. I go on Instacart. Like, why do I ever go to the grocery store? Like now I'm, I don't ever want to go back to the grocery store again, ever, personally. Like I can click a button on Instacart and shop, you know, like, and it shows my door that night. Why? Why would I ever go back to the grocery store? I don't know. Give me a reason, James, to go back. I don't know. So all those investments that Amazon has been making over the last 15 to 18 years, building expensive warehouses, building uh, transportation between the net, between the different warehouses, that, that is a humongous investment that Amazon's made. It is paying dividends so many times over right now. And quite frankly, there is no other retailer out there, online or offline, that can compete with this. In fact, I would argue there's no government organization that can compete with this either. Amazon has better distribution tentacles of more products to more people right now than anybody in this country. Not even the National Guard can do this right now. Amazon is, is the be-all, end-all when it comes to the ability to push everything and anything that consumers need into their homes as quickly as possible, with, with some call out to what Walmart.com can do as well. So... I want to talk about the challenges we should be on the lookout for because some of them, you know, we sometimes only see what's right in front of us, yep. not yep. what's in the distance. Before we talk about that, are there any challenges that we should talk about that people are facing now um, that we haven't discussed as far as Amazon sellers? The, the reality is while prime customers as uh, on, on average are higher household incomes, the reality is there, there's a significant amount of unemployment that is either already started or is about to get accelerated as uh, service companies and retailers and restaurants no longer can make payroll and have to start laying people off. When people don't have money coming in, then they stop buying not only the stuff that they like, but also the stuff that they need. And so even if the federal bailout provides homes with two or three thousand dollars. That's not going to last very long, and so we're, we're going to see a much bigger uh, split between the haves and the have-nots. Who's got disposable income and savings, and who doesn't? And 
I'm a social Democrat from Canada, and I'm used to having some sort of a safety net. And unfortunately, the form of capitalism we have in this country um, doesn't doesn't provide much safety net for large portions of the population. And so we're going to see a lot of uh, ugliness that follows if this situation continues for another two to three months, because it doesn't just end at two to three months. It ends at, okay, you can re-engage with society. Now you got to go find a job. Now you got to figure out how to make enough money to pay all the bills that you've been accumulating. That's where the ugliness really becomes apparent for everyone. Yeah. I mean, just in the past two days, James, I've talked to just a few people, just not even a large number of people, a few yep. people who have been forced to lay off oh, an excess of 450 people. And that's just a few conversations I've had. So I can't even imagine what that looks like across everyone. You know, I think it's Thursday night, we'll see the federal unemployment numbers. And I, I'm afraid they're going to be a complete, you know, total bloodbath. And when, when we see just how many people now don't have jobs, but also don't have the prospects of getting a job until this whole thing uh, settles down, goodness me, that's, um, yeah. What do you think, I mean, as a broader level, we'll bring it back to Amazon in a second. What do you think um, should, be, should be done or can be done in general? I mean, I know like the government has offered like these SBA loans, but that's, yeah. I don't really know if that's going to stop any bleeding necessarily. So maybe a little bit. You know, I, I certainly encourage anyone listening who is in a position to qualify for an SBA loan. The emergency SBA loan program is uh, much less hurdlesome than the traditional SBA loan process. Um, we, we've applied for one. I don't know if we're going to get it, but you know, there, there are lots of folks out there that will likely qualify that didn't realize they would qualify. Yeah. It doesn't take long to fill out the paperwork and see what you can do. Um, this is also a time where you basically say, what are all the trees I can shake to figure out how to get more cash or how to delay paying? So just as we talked earlier around, have those conversations with your vendors and say, can you give me better terms? Can you delay payment um, versus go find your rich uncle and say, Hey man, now's the time I need that hundred thousand dollar loan. Because <laughs> um, because the reality is, the, the the factor we need beyond keeping ourselves healthy, the factor we have to be focused on primarily as entrepreneurs right now is how to manage and hoard cash. Yeah. When I say hoard, I don't mean hoard the way we hoard toilet paper. I mean you got to have more cash on hand than you normally would because the level of uncertainty we're dealing with right now is so scary. I don't know what's around the next corner in terms of what additional unexpected cost I might incur. Like, oh my gosh, I got huge medical expenses because someone got sick, or oh my gosh, um, you know, a local disaster happened. You know, one my, my company has an office in in Salt Lake City, and a day after we sent everybody home, there was an earthquake in Salt Lake City. Now, wow. fortunately, the earthquake didn't cause a lot of harm because the buildings were set up properly, but these kinds of additional crazy things that happen on top of everything else, we need cash to be able to cover that. Because if you have cash, you're in control. If you don't have cash, then somebody else has to help you. And everybody right now needs some type of help. And so the more you can help yourself because you've got cash to enable that, the better position we're all in. So, um, I guess we can point people towards, if you go to sba.gov and there is some tab where it goes to disaster assistance, there's SBA provides low interest disaster loans. And so you can go to sba.gov and find it. It's under a couple of tabs like funding programs. So you can yeah, and these check are, some that of these out. These are 30 year loans at very low interest rates. Yeah. So um, cer certainly something to explore if you're anticipating a cascading negative effect of not being paid or not being able to pay others. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if you're able to support a loan, you can be a hero in your value chain by either making sure that everybody gets paid, making sure that you're in a position that you can offer better terms to people downstream who need your services. That, that's all good stuff. And if you can, if you can support better terms of people that owe you money, you know, they'll remember that when, when things get better on the other side. Any other resources you think would be important to point people towards, or is that the main one? 
when my world of Amazon sellers is not a group that traditionally gets traditional lending from banks. They're having to use uh, alternative sources for lending as it is. And I'm not talking, you know, Tony down at the end of the bar who's going to lend you <laughs> money, but you know, the reality is a lot of it is angel investors and family and uh, boot, bootstrapping everything to keep growing. Bootstrapping is great, but when, when you don't have the money to support the fact that somebody can't pay you and now you've got to come up with more money to keep the lights on, um, you know, you have to get creative about where where do you shake the trees to find additional capital, or where where do you go have ha- hard conversations with the people around? I can't pay you, still want to work with you. You're going to need to give me 60 days to come up with funds to pay for this. James, are there any other lending institutions people should look at? You know, obviously SBA. I think um, I interviewed um, the people at Cabbage. Um, actually, and we didn't mention the beginning, uh, James and Joe, uh, founded the prosper show, which is one of the leading, uh, conferences for e-commerce. Um, and so for Amazon sellers, and, um, I, I believe I met the cabbage people at one of the prosper shows, um, as well. Mm-hmm. What, um, other lending institutions, maybe traditional or not, should people look at? So there, there are companies that will help finance a loan based on your FBA inventory if you're mm-hmm. an Amazon seller. Uh, you know, I, I know I've heard of this company called Payability. Mm-hmm. Um, there are other companies like that out there that will, again, g- give you some factor of the level of inventory you have based on the expected sell-through yeah. rate and so on. I, I have no financial interest in these companies. I just know that they exist, and there, there are ways that Amazon sellers can get some funding. but the challenge is you don't have a lot of cash on hand right now. And unless you know that you're going to start getting cash by selling products that become popular again, um, the terms that you're going to get on a loan like that may not necessarily be ideal. But the question is, I'm not optimizing for long-term right now. I am opti- optimizing for short-term survival. The, the, the dinghy has a hole in it and I'm starting to sink. How do I plug the dinghy? That's what I got to do right now. Yeah. So, Thanks for, for pointing that out too, by the way, with some of those lending and resources. And, and you know, again, we're not endorsing any of them, but you just got to do your own due diligence on the ones that are out there. Um, the other piece that we were going to chat about is the challenges people should be on the lookout for in the future. Um, yeah. So I, I can speak as someone working with third-party sellers on Amazon, the marketplace has encouraged a lot of people to double down on growth every single day. And the double down philosophy is wonderful when the wave keeps going up. But when you start to have variants like this that we can't control, external factors we, we, we can't control ourselves, um, that's where you realize doubling down every time and not holding back cash and saying, do we have alternative channels to sell in? Do we have suppliers in more than one country? Do we have the ability to have extra inventory sitting in a super secret location so that on the rainy day we can pull it out and use it if necessary? All of these are different forms of contingency that for many companies that are born on Amazon resellers, a lot of them have not been in a position or chosen not to take that sort of contingency direction because they're trying to grow as fast as they possibly can right here and now which obviously has its risks when there's variability, like not even like what we're dealing now. I mean, think, think to a world six months ago, if Amazon suspends your account for two weeks and you have no capital coming in for two weeks, what do you do? Well, I better have some cash available to keep the lights on. Okay, well, what happens now? Coronavirus comes along and now it's a six week, eight week, 16 week situation where I've got to keep the lights on. I've got to make some very hard choices but what I do and don't do in, in the short term, but I also need to make sure that I've got some working capital. To, to me, that one of the bigger problems here, Jeremy, is that l- let's let's fast forward to a point where we're back in a situation where, you know, we're all interacting with each other in society. What what's going to happen in terms of companies going back to the behaviors they had before versus companies realizing I'm okay not growing as fast because I'd rather have a cushion at all times that allows me to be in a position where 
if there's a little bump in the road, it's not a devastating impact on my overall business. This is not just, you know, this is not a job for us. This is our livelihoods. And so if it's our livelihoods, think of what do we do today? You buy a house. Yeah, but you also buy insurance for the house. And you also cut down the branch that's hanging over your house. You do those types of things. And yet for many sellers on Amazon, they didn't do those types of things to say, this is actually the golden goose and I need to protect the golden goose. And I need to make sure it's well fed, but also if something goes wrong, I'm in a position to be able to keep things going forward. And so that willingness to say, you know what, I may have some irrational competitors and I'm okay letting them continue to be rational because I have to control my own desire to continue to exist when the next rainstorm comes along. So James, that being said, you know, there's lots and lots and long lists of challenges now and probably in the future. Um, and you mentioned there's a bunch of opportunities in this climate also. Um, what are some of those opportunities people should be on the lookout for? So as I, as I think about as an entrepreneur, the first opportunity is to look at where have I not diversified or spread risk around as much as I should have? Am I selling in, in two or three other channels where I should be selling? Do I sell too many products in only one category where consumer preference swings one way or the other are going to greatly impact my ability to continue to have revenue? Looking at all these decisions you've often unknowingly or implicitly made and challenging yourself on how do I, how do I spread the risk around a little bit more? And spreading a risk amount around means you're not going to make as much money just like, you know, if you don't put all your money on the same number in, in the casino, you're not going to win as much money, but you're also not going to lose as much money. And so being willing to say, I'm willing to go in for, you know, 10% year over year growth rather than trying to double down in 30% growth year over year. 30% growth is wonderful, but it also comes with that risk of if you can't sustain a proper cushion to protect you against the rainy day situation, you're, you're going to be in trouble. So for companies that still have capital and are still at least uh, above above water and are able to keep going during this time of uncertainty, there will be opportunity for them to say, "Listen, there's share for us, uh, market share that we can go after." Because you know, right now is the time for companies that have cash; they should still be spending money on advertising. They should still be able to get out there and get their brand name in front of as many people as possible. Because uh, you know, as you build brand, if you build now, you're going to be in a much better position when many of your competitors are having to cut back completely. You know, it's kind of like we're, we're, we're in a, you know, the Indy 500 and the safety flag is waving. We all have to slow down, but slowing down doesn't mean that I actually want to fall behind everybody else. It means that I've still got my foot on the pedal and I am ready to go. And as soon as we can all keep moving, every advantage I can create for myself, I need to continue to create for myself. So let's say you have enough money right now to keep going. Let's say you have enough inventory to keep selling. This is a time to be asking yourself, is the strategy I have for growth too focused on too few products, too few categories, too few suppliers, too few sales channels? If it is, start to look at what those alternatives are. It doesn't mean you implement things right now because implementing right now can be very, very uh, risky, even riskier than ever. And consumer preferences are so hyper-focused on certain things that even if the long-term plan involves diversifying outside of what's popular right now, it's good to at least know where you need to be going so that you can act on it when things start to become a little bit more stable. So I feel a little bit like a broken record here because so much of what can be done right now is really around accepting slightly less growth, but having more, more safety around our business and also be willing to say, you know what, I don't need to grow at the highest rate possible in order to maximize my, my ego. I actually need to look at multiple things that I'm trying to prioritize and balance those multiple things. It's not just the fastest growth possible. The number of Amazon sellers that I have dealt with in the last 11 or 12 years who want to tell me that they grow so fast year over year over year, top line growth, bottom line growth hasn't grown as fast. You know, I don't really care about the ego components of growth. What I care about is 
have you built something that is sustainable through uh, variants, not necessarily as big as right now, but can your business continue to grow if you're, if you're throwing a curveball here, here, and here that cause you to have to change direction a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. From what I hear from you, James, it's like the two biggest things are diversification and redundancy. You know, if you have one supplier, how do you get three? You know, how do you put those redundancies in place and diversification? If you have, you know, two products, maybe not necessarily you implement now, but you think about how you diversify. So all your eggs are in one basket. Is that? Those are both, those are both accurate. It's important to understand that there's a, there's, a, there's a third component to that, which is you need to explicitly accept the fact that diversification probably means lower returns, lower growth, and you have to be willing to live with that because it's important to have safety. You can't just have growth. And so you need to be willing to say, it's not a bad thing that I had 40% growth last year, but this year I'm only going to have 10% growth, and that's okay because I have reinforced parts of my business to be able to protect against the next tidal wave that hits me. Right. So James, I'm curious of what your thoughts are on, you know, as you see companies going into business, what do you think is going to happen with consolidation or companies, you know, buying other companies that, you know, they do survive and then ones are distressed. Yeah. What, what do you, how do you see the consolidation going? So the, different types of companies, as you know, on Amazon, if you are reselling someone else's product and you go out of business, then you will basically cease to exist and nobody will notice because your products are going to be sold by a bunch of other people anyways. There are also a whole class of born on Amazon brands, companies that exist um, to sell private label products on Amazon. For many of them, they don't really have a brand per se in the sense that someone would say, your brand means something. I want to buy it from you uh, because the brand means something. Not the cash flow that comes from the brand, but the actual brand means something. And for all those companies that are basically just cash flows on sales, as opposed to a, a well-deserved premium that you've developed through building your brand, if those companies go out of business, no one's going to notice. There may be a few cases of inventory sitting around that somebody buys and just liquidates, but those brands basically cease to exist and nobody will be the wiser in six months from now. For large brands that are well-established, that have high brand recognition, if those starts, companies start to fall, then somebody will come along and say, you know what, the, this brand stands for something, I'm gonna buy it, and while I may not sell anything against that brand anytime soon, that brand is worth something in consumers' minds and I'm prepared to pay something for it. There are companies, you know, private equity and, 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 and PE companies that, or VC and PE companies that specialize in buying up old brands that don't really have any sales or don't have as, as well-established uh, current, you know, short-term track record, but if reinvigorated could mean something. And some of those companies, if they become available for, you know, because of financial hardship, somebody will snap them up and say, okay, yep, I can now take my widget, put that brand name on it and sell it. And people may in fact be inspired by that and be prepared to pay a premium. Mm -hmm. So you don't think like, let's say, you know, in the example of someone selling a brand, their own brand, yep. but it's not, there's not really a brand recognition. Let's say I'm selling an apron. Like I don't really shop. I have a specific brand. I need to buy this brand to buy an apron or something like yep. that. Do you think there's an opportunity for them if they're going out of business to somehow sell their company, which may be just their listing space to a branded company that can stamp their brand on it because they've seen a certain velocity of sales over the past five or six years, but that person can't maintain that account or not really. If we're talking about the Amazon platform, Amazon, the, the, the marketplace has devalued brand equity significantly. It's less about, hey, my brand's a 100-year-old brand that's you know, generated all these sales over, over the lifetime of the brand, and more about, do you know how to optimize your listing? Do you know how to spend money on advertising to drive traffic to your listings? Those are the things that matter. And turns out all sorts of people who have very little experience in building a actual brand business, they can win on Amazon because they have good enough margins to be able to invest in traffic generating exercises, and they have pretty decent listings. So when the time comes that that brand falls apart, 
or disappears because of cash flow issues, um, if, if there isn't really a brand, meaning consumers saying, oh my gosh, this brand doesn't exist anymore, that's horrible, I was prepared to pay this premium to buy it, what am I going to do? That's not a typical customer behavior on Amazon. A typical customer behavior on Amazon is, I need to buy vitamins, what's on the first page of search? Oh, let's buy this one, that looks like a pretty good price, so look at the yeah. listing, yep, looks great, add to my cart. When that listing's not there, most consumers don't even remember that it was there last time they checked, because there's still another 500 pretty good listings that are on the first 10 pages of, of, of search. Yeah. So it becomes this challenge where um, there's, there's not a lot of branding per se in terms of, or I shouldn't say branding, there's not a lot of brand building per se across most of these born on Amazon brands. Yeah, that makes sense. James, first of all, thank you. Thanks for your expertise. Thanks for taking the time. Um, I have one last question, but I just want to point people to uh, Buybox Experts um, and check out what they're doing. Check out their podcast. You can go to buyboxexperts.com and um, everything they, they do. And the last question kind of relates to that, James, which is right now in today's climate, you know, people are realizing or they are going to or should realize that they need to have an online presence. They need to have an Amazon presence um, because that's where people are going. You know, that's just where, what the buyer behavior is. You just go with the buyer behavior. Don't go against it. Um, who are ideal clients to engage with buy box experts? We, we work with brands that realize that they don't know everything they need to know about Amazon. The Amazon sandbox is not like any other retail sandbox out there. And so we work with brands to educate them on, how to think about not only selling on Amazon, but more importantly, how does Amazon fit in with all the other channel management decisions you make in, in other parts of your distribution strategy? So uh, we like brands that are pretty much any kind of widget that can be sold on Amazon. And we're not, we're not specific to any type of product. Amazon doesn't treat one type of widget different from another. For all intents and purposes, Amazon is a huge transactional marketplace of widgets. And so how do you as a brand get at least decent transactions out of the exercise. You may not get brand building out of it, but at least get customers out of it and get transactioned out of it. Uh, you know, we, we help clients to think about these big difficult questions of how do you make sure Amazon fits into what you're doing everywhere else? How do you make sure that what you're doing everywhere else doesn't create problems for you on Amazon? At the end of the day, a brand has to be a set of consistent promises delivered to customers in every channel and, and for so many companies that we've started working with, um, they, they want to have one type of exercise in place on Amazon and another one in another channel. And very quickly, they realize that they're not in control of what happens on Amazon because they're not in control of what's actually happening in these other channels. So we help companies think these problems through. They're complicated problems. They're the kinds of problems that cause executives to have to scratch their head and realize they have to evolve. Um, but the reality is consumers move to places like Amazon. Brands need to figure out how to incorporate Amazon to their total channel strategy. And we're there to help the executive team make, make those tough decisions. James, um, what are some of the big pain points these people come to you with? Is it because they're a brand, they need to monitor who's selling their stuff? Um, what, what are some of the pain points usually these clients come with? The single biggest pain point that brands have is they are used to selling product in a variety of retail channels and they don't understand how all that product ended up on Amazon or at least how some of it ended up on Amazon. It's usually sold by companies they can't, they don't recognize. It's usually sold at prices below what the brands would like to see the products being sold at. And so you end up creating conflict with the other traditional retail channels who say, why is the product always cheaper on Amazon? The brand usually says, we don't know who these people are. We don't understand how to control distribution across all channels. That's the first problem to solve. And that's the hardest problem for companies to solve when they're typically driven by short-term sales numbers. If you're telling your sales team, just keep going out there and selling so that we can hit this quarter's numbers, but at the same time, go ahead and sell to whoever comes along with a purchase order in cash may result in products being diverted and creating this problem that you have on Amazon today. Those are issues that a lot of brand leadership teams haven't thought through carefully enough to understand that they're 
unknowingly encouraging the wrong kind of behavior from their sales teams or their distributors or their retailers to create this problem on Amazon that while Amazon may not be a big channel in terms of total sales, it's a highly visible channel that anybody in any other channel could see. And you can create a lot of strife, a lot of frustration by your longtime retailers and distributors who realize that you, the brand, you're not actually driving the plane. Somebody <laughs> else is, and it's, it's usually a bunch of unauthorized sellers having fun at your expense. Nice. James, thank you again. Check out buyboxexperts.com and um, listen to this one again because there's some, some real gems there. So first one to thank you. Thanks, James. Thanks very much for having me on, Jeremy. Take care and take, stay safe. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, like a peach if you find the same right now. I feel like a hundred grand.